possession from the Dutch without firing a shot, the city began to grow. By 1750, it had become a thriving commercial center. New York sends many ships to the West Indies with flour, grain, biscuit, timber, boards, meat and pork, butter, and other provisions. In return for these, cloth is imported from London, and so is every article of English growth or manufacture. New York is a pleasant place. The streets do not run as straight as those of Philadelphia, and sometimes are quite crooked, but they are spacious and well built. In the chief streets, trees are planted, which in the summer give a fine appearance, and during the excessive heat at that time afford a cooling shade. I find it extremely pleasant to walk in the town, for it seems like a garden. The port is a good one. Ships of the greatest tonnage can lie in it. Its water is very salty and therefore never frozen except in very cold weather. This is a great advantage to the city and to its commerce. People of many countries walk its streets and work upon its crowded wharves, German, Dutch, Portuguese, English, Scots, and Irish. Slaves, too, were brought in to work on the estates and in the houses of the wealthy merchants and landlords. To be sold at Public Bond due on Friday, May 17, 1751, at 10 o'clock in the morning at the Corn Market, a number of likely Negro slaves lightly imported in the sloop wolf directly from Africa. July 9, 1776. Today, the Declaration of Independence was read to the Continental Army posted at New York. It was greeted everywhere with loud huzzas. Yeah! July 10th. Today, the equestrian statue of George III, which Tory Pride and Folly erected in 1770, was by the Sons of Liberty laid prostrate in the dirt. The lead of which the statue was made is to be made into bullets. At the same time, the king's coat of arms was brought from City Hall, where he commonly held his court and burned amid the acclamations of thousands of spectators. Alex McDougall here and I were the leaders of the Sons of Liberty. On September 15th, the British landed at the Bowery and within a few hours took the city back. All we left them was ashes. On September 22nd, a great fire broke out in the most southerly part of the city. The wind coming very fresh from the south and the weather exceedingly dry. The rebel army had carried off all the church bells, so the alarm could not be rung. The fire was observed to break out in five or six places at a considerable distance from each other. The fire raged with inconceivable fury and swept away all the buildings between Broad Street and the North River. Trinity Church went up in flames. Its steeple, 140 feet high, was a pyramid of fire. The shrieks of those who perished in the blaze, the roaring of the flames, the crash of falling houses created a scene beyond description. That very day, while New York still smoldered, Howe's army took Nathan Hale, the Connecticut schoolmaster, on suspicion of being a spy, dragged him without ceremony to the execution post, and hung him up. The breezes went steadily through the tall pines, a saying, oh hush, a saying, oh hush, as still he stole by a bold legion of horse For hell in the bush, for hell in the bush Cooling shades of the night were upcoming apace The tattoo had beat, the tattoo had beat The noble one sprang from his dark lurking place To make his retreat, to make his retreat the god of the camp on that dark, dreary night Had a murderous will, had a murderous will They took him and bore him away from the shore To a hut on the hill, to a hut on the hill They took him and bound him and bore him away Down the hill's grassy side, down the hill's grassy side T'was there the base hirelings in royal array his cause did deride, his cause did deride. The fate of a martyr, the tragedy showed as he trod the last stage, as he trod the last stage. And Britons will tremble at Gallantel's blood as his words do presage, as his words do presage. When Washington took office as President of the United States in 1789, 
The Tammany Society was founded in New York to give him support. It speedily became the leading democratic club in the country. In 1800, it organized the workers and immigrants of the city into a wild campaign for the election of Thomas Jefferson as president. The streets of the city resounded with Tammany's great election song, set to the tune of an Irish jig. The gloomy night before us flies, the reign of terror now is o'er, it's gags, inquisitors, and spies. Its herds of harpies are no more. Shall ring from industry the food nor fiery bigots, holy laws. Lay waste our fields and streets in blood. Here, strangers from a thousand shores, compelled by tyranny to roam, shall find amidst abundant stores. A nobler and a happier home. Here art shall lift her laurel head, wealth, industry, and peace divine. And where dark pathless forests spread. Great fields and lofty city shine. The end of the revolution and the opening of the 19th century spelled a new era in the history of New York. The city was the only coastal port that had direct access to the mighty continent and back of it through the Hudson Mohawk route and the Great Gap in the Appalachian chain. When the Erie Canal was opened in 1824, immigrants thronged to the city en route to the western states. The wealth of America began to pour through New York on its way outwards to the markets of the world. When peace came in 1815, the Irish streamed to America to dig canals, including the Erie Canal, and to build railroads. They flocked to New York, where they settled in the Five Points District. They made it the largest Irish community outside of Dublin. It was an area of filthy tenements, brutality, squalor, and despair. into gangs, the Patsy Conroys, O'Connell Guards, Bowery Boys, Plug Uglies, Shirt Tails, Dead Rabbits, and Swamp Angels. In a rumble, no quarter was given or expected. Eyes were gouged and stricken foes were stomped to death. Volunteer firefighting companies provided a wholesome outlet for community rivalry. Fire! Fire! Move along, Plug Ugly. This is our fire. As the Irish moved in, the older settlers fled uptown. Stone and brick began to creep northwards across Manhattan's fields at the rate of about one mile every ten years. By 1860, when the Civil War broke out, the city boasted nearly one half a million people, and it stretched nearly five miles from the tip of Manhattan to 42nd Street. New York was now a vast melting pot. The Civil War brought it to a boil. Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves on January 1st, 1863, 
and Congress passed the draft law the following spring. The New York Irish now lived on the edge of destitution. When they came back from the war, would they find what jobs there were filled by black men? The full fury of the mob is falling on New York's Negro people. They are being driven into hiding with the storm of oaths, bludgeons, and brickbats. Negroes must run for their lives, leap into the river. They are tracked down to their hiding places on the roofs of houses and are cast over the edge. For the common orphan asylum! The asylum was a handsome structure, erected in 1858 on Fifth Avenue between 43rd and 44th Streets. The mob has fallen upon this building with a fury untempered by mercy. The rooms have been sacked, the spoils thrown to the Irish women. The inmates have been cruelly beaten. Even little children have been kicked and trampled upon. To crown the inhuman crime, arson has been added to murder, and the building is now a mass of flames. We have been hung from trees and street lamps, shot down and hunted like dogs. But it's now resolved that we shall kill two Irish for every one of us who is killed. New immigrants flooded in by the millions from Eastern and Southern Europe. Between 1890 and 1914, 15 million people came into the United States. One and one half million of these were Jews. They came principally from the Baltic and Polish provinces of Tsarist Russia, driven by violence, poverty, and persecution. The men went first to earn in heartsick loneliness the funds with which they could bring their loved ones over after them. Oi, Dalton, Dalton, Ibn Fasser. Oi, Dalton, Dalton, Ibn Brick. Vertrieben hast du mich in die weiten Länder. Und da bänken, bänk ich nach dir zu. Spectacles, 
The old songs of Europe began to echo in a new cage, the sweatshops and tenements of the garment industry on the Lower East Side. Zu kuschen scheint dem Ponim und zu hol dein Hand. Silver is the daylight and blue is the sea. Bright is the new love you have brought to me. Let me stay near you always. Let our fingers twine, let me kiss your rose red lips, let me call you mine. Last night I went to a wedding, I danced through the night. A thousand thousand pretty girls danced into my sight. A thousand, thousand pretty girls, but none like you so fair. With your black and dancing eyes and your black and dancing hair. I see you everywhere in earth, sea, and sky. My love torments me. As the days go by, my love torments me always as I sit alone and gaze at the black and sparkling vault where I sing my song of praise. Oh God in heaven, grant me my cherished dream. Grant me a hut for my palace Where my love and I may be In the green and pleasant meadow Where the silver streams flow free Papier ist doch weiß Und in ist stark schwarz Zu dir mein Sies Leben, sit auch mein Herz. Ich vollständig gesessen, drohtig nach anan. Zu kuschen scheint dem Ponen und zu hol dein Hand. For the Jewish immigrant, the city is an endless panorama of tenements, row upon row between stony streets, stretching to the north, to the south, to the west, as far as the eye reaches. Here, in the stifling, stinking, windowless rooms, children are born and children die. Sleep, my child, my sweet, my pretty one. Sleep, my darling, sleep.
that the poverty and oppression of the American South rivaled the pogroms of Tsarist Russia. Black fugitives fled northward, dreaming like the Jews of a promised land in New York. Harlem was waiting for them. Its present vermin-ridden tenements were built, most of them, between 1870 and 1900 as mansions for the rich or apartments for the well-to-do. It made a swift transition to the most notorious slum ghetto in the nation. Speculators began to rent to Negroes. Property values dropped and the white inhabitants fled. The landlords began to pack the black migrants into the once fashionable brownstones. Turning them into filthy tenements, they coined their wealth from the bitter needs of the poor. So they came from all parts of the South, like all the black children of God, following the sound of Gabriel's horn on that long overdue judgment day. The Georgians came as soon as they were able to pick train fare off the peach trees. They came from South Carolina, where the cotton stalks were bare. The North Carolinians came with tobacco tar beneath their fingernails. They felt as the pilgrims must have felt when they were coming to America. But these descendants of Ham must have been twice as happy as the pilgrims because they had been catching twice the hell. Even while planning the trip, they sang spirituals as Jesus take my hand and I'm on my way and chanted hallelujah, I'm on my way to the promised land. Take my hand, Lord Jesus, take my hand. people, full of hate, crowded into a dirty, stinking, uncared-for, closet-sized section of a big city. Where does one run to when he is already in the promised land? The most recent influx into New York has been that of the Puerto Rican people who came at the end of World War II. Dios mio, I don't think I'll ever see my island again. Sure you will. Mama, tell us about Puerto Rico. When I was a little girl, I remember the getting up in the morning and getting water from the river and wood for the fire and the quiet of the green lands and the golden color of the morning sky. I, Dios, and the coquis and pajaritos making musica. Mama, were you poor? See, si, we pobre, but very happy. Mom, did everybody love each other? I mean, like if everybody was worth something, not like if some weren't important because they were poor. Bueno, hijo, you have people everywhere who, because they have more, forget those who have very little. I like those Estados Unidos, but it's a cold place to live, not because of the winter and the landlord not giving heat, but because of the snow in the hearts of the people. It is 1967. The waters of the Hudson flow down to the sea through the wilderness of slums and skyscrapers. Set this stream, still I love it, and I'll keep the dream day. Though maybe not this year, my Hudson River will once again run clear. It starts high in the mountains of the north, crystal clear, and icy trickles forth. With just a few rafters of chewing gum, dropped by hikers to warn of things to come. Sailing down this sturdy stream Still I love it and I'll keep the dream That someday, though maybe not this year My Hudson and my country Will once again run clear Past Manhattan stretches Megalopolis Man has multiplied in a million little boxes That squat in rows across the land Arise skyward in modular monoliths 
Little boxes on the hillside, little boxes made of ticky tacky little boxes, little boxes, little boxes, all the same. There's a green one, and a pink one, and a blue one, and a yellow one, and they're all made out of ticky tacky, and they all look just the same. Little boxes. Where they were put in boxes And they came out doctors And there's lawyers And there's business executives And they're all made out of ticky-tacky And they all look just the same Pretty children, and the children go to school, and the children go to summer camp, and then to the university where they are put in boxes, and they come out all the same. Little boxes on the hillside, little boxes made of ticky tacky little boxes. Northwest wind is blowing. It is laden with heavy scents wafted in from New Jersey. <laughs> Will the grass grow again in Manhattan? <laughs> 